everybody. Well, welcome yet again to our pre-recorded live uh, Journal Club. Uh, get, get having a second go at this since we had some technical issues due to our live stream uh, uh, broadcast. So once again, I'm Oliver Medvig uh, coming to you from New York City, uh, Canbar Center for Biomedical Engineering here at the Cooper Union. Joining me is Steve and Sven. Um, and behind the scenes is Fatna, Fat, Fatima. Fatima. Is it pronounced Fatima? Fatima? What's the pronunciation of that? We're gonna delete it. We're gonna edit that anyway. Fatima. We yeah. we can't edit it, uh, Oliver, because we're live. We're live oh. on Facebook. I said I am recording as well as a backup. Okay. It's okay, folks. Oliver o Oliver thought we were just recording this and he could say what he likes, but we are oh. actually live. Oh, we are actually live. Okay. Oh yes. All right. Well, it's a good thing I didn't get out any expletives there. Anyway. Um, so the journal article, those of you who tried to uh, tune in yesterday, is um, from eBiomedicine. It's uh, Jamie and Justice et al. paper um, from two clinics. Um, it's a pilot study, first in human study, and I'm going to share my screen with you here. It's Senolytics uh, and Idiopathic Pulmonary Fibrosis. Um, results from a first in human open label pilot study. So what I want to emphasize here is that this is a small scale study. Um, it's a pilot study, meaning that this is sort of going to form the, um, I guess, uh, groundwork for a much uh, larger study that's, uh, I believe, may actually be, you know, um, recruiting right now. Um, I'd like to email the, uh, the um, last author on this paper, James Kirkland, uh, who's at the Mayo Clinic. Um, but this is a first in human open label study. So that means unlike other, you know, typical clinical trials, uh, both the, uh, both the doctors and the participants basically know what's happening. They know what, uh, what therapeutic is being given. And in this uh, study here, the senolytics are quercetin and bisatinib, bisatinib uh, so DQ. And these are senolytics that have been studied um, in a number of different uh animal models and um, also in uh, cell culture. And basically one of the reasons given for why idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis has been chosen is that um, the animal, uh, animal model in mice, uh, you know, has been well established uh, for um, IPF. Um, it's also, you know, known to be, you know, um, worsened by senescence and senescent uh, cells. And so obviously this would be a candidate, candidate then for senolytics. Um, and also kind of an added advantage is that uh, as we, you know, have remarked on many times before here, um, you know, you can't currently, you know, market a drug or even do trials for something that's anti-aging, but what you can do is target diseases of aging. And since aging is really the, you know, main driver for all of these diseases, these diseases of aging, um, cancers, uh, heart disease, uh, dementia, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, anything that we can target uh, for those diseases obviously is going to have a spillover effect for aging in general. Um, so, you know, for those reasons, uh, IPF is chosen. Uh, plus, there are, you know, uh, we can directly measure um, some of the outcomes here, and we'll kind of, we're going to stop sharing. And what we're going to do is kind of go through kind of the, the groundwork of this paper and um, uh, what the setup is. So let's go back to uh, sharing screen. All right. So um, basically what the authors wanted to do here is, uh, you know, their, their pri primary endpoint is really not the cure of, in this paper, uh, perhaps in the trial that's, uh, you know, that is being uh, organized now. In this paper, you know, the cure of IPF isn't the, you know, the primary endpoint. The primary endpoint is, uh, as they state in the paper, and you can read this here, but I'll just read it, uh, is retention rates and completion rates for the planned clinical assessment. So they wanted to make sure, you know, that they establish um, centers where they can recruit patients and that whatever, you know, that they're gonna be giving these patients you can, you know, they can stick to the protocol. And uh, that's pretty important because we're not dealing with mice here, we're not dealing with cells in a tissue culture, but, you know, humans with all their, you know, 
problems, et cetera, et cetera. So you want patients to stick through whatever interventions you're giving. So, you know, this was a, a kind of a really nicely done um, first run. Uh, and they're pretty successful at that in this case. And the secondary endpoints were initial safety estimates and adverse health reports, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, for quercetin, at least, uh, the safety profile is pretty good. Um, uh, Disatinib has, you know, its own safety issues. It's, uh, its primary indication, I believe, that it's given right now is for patients uh, of leukemia. Um, so they wanted to make sure that, uh, that there were no adverse uh, effects. And again, in this trial here, they're not, you know, the good thing is they're not working with just healthy volunteers, you know, to get a safety profile because, um, you know, quercetin uh, is fairly safe. Uh, the satin has been studied already, you know, in a number of other trials, and phase one trials have been done. Um, so they wanted to go directly into, you know, already sick individuals uh, who are suffering from um, IPF. Um, so their secondary um, endpoints were actually the change in functional and reported health measures, right? So that's, that's kind of what we're all interested in. Um, again, but this is a very small trial, so I'm going to scroll through uh, flow chart here, um, you know, enrollment allocation follow-up and analysis um, after, you know, screening for a number of uh, participants, uh, basically they ended up with a group of 14 people. Um, so very, very small um, sample and, you know, and they were able to do as, you know, as much statistical analysis as they could you know, do given the sample size. <clears throat> So when we go, uh, so here are the patient characteristics. So, you know, you can go through and run through the ethnicity profile of people, um, you know, uh, their sex, um, their age, so on and so forth. And I'm gonna scroll back up here. Probably scrolling the wrong way, as usual. And here's their dosing. So um, one thing I like, you know, so there's, you know, there's a number of things I like about the trial. It's pretty well organized. The other thing is that they're using realistic dosing, so they're not going, you know, suboptimal dosing. Um, one thing that we've seen when we've looked at a number of already senolytic papers um, is that you got to you got to get a fairly high dose to knock out senescent cells. Um, so for their intermittent dosing, uh, they chose 100 milligrams per day of uh, desatinib which I believe is based on, you know, trials that have already been done with desatinib in patients. Um, and for quercetin, they used a pretty high dose of uh, 1,250 milligrams. So 1.25 grams uh, per day of, of the, you know, this plant compound, um, which basically, you know, um, tells you right there, it's, it's a pretty safe compound if, if you're taking that high of a dose. And the dosing was intermittent. So they have week one, two, and three, and then a follow-up, I believe, five days later um, to basically take these um, secondary endpoints, um, which were the change in functional and reported health measures. Um, and the dosing was intermittent, meaning that, you know, a few days it was given, then there was a pause, and then, you know, there's an adherence check, right, to make sure that patients are still taking it. There's symptom questionnaires, adverse event reporting. So they kind of hopscotch from one you know, week one, two, three, and that's kind of typical what you see with the dosing regimen for senolytics. Um, and the good thing about senolytics is at least the hypothesis for how they work, it's sort of, uh, you know, as the authors claim, a hit and run model. Um, yeah, you know, proteins are being targeted, receptors are being bound, um, but really what, you're, what ends up happening is, you know, senescence clearance or perhaps, uh, you know, a reversion from senescence state to a non-senescent state. So that means that you know you, you blast an individual or cells with um, senolytics, and then um, things hopefully revert, you know, more or less back to normal. So you don't have to give chronic dosages. Um, so that was their regimen. And scrolling down, we have you know a table of severity of adverse effects. So the good news is that. I believe there was one serious adverse event. I have to dig through the paper, and I'm not sure if it was actually related to the actual treatment. But you know, most of them were either mild, or moderate, and you know, if I'm not going to go through you know this table in detail, but you can you know look through and, and see how many patients uh, had shortness of breath, uh, nausea, so on and so forth. And um, you see these types of tables for any kind of um, clinical trial uh, that's being done. Um, 
and you know, these are again sick patients to begin with. You know, patients that are suffering from um, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So, um, you know, even if you were to have a control group, which they don't have in this case, you typically, you know, through the duration of a trial, you know, um, spontaneously adverse effects will happen. So, I don't know how far this is from the norm, um, but um, I think I think it's fairly typical. So, I'm gonna stop sharing here for a little while. Uh, so that's the layup, you know, for the for the trial so far. Um, and kind of the what everybody's interested in, obviously, is does it work? And, you know, I'm going to just say right now that uh, the bottom line is, you know, well, I'm going to go to the data, but maybe is, is the answer. Um, the needle looks like it's slightly moved in a positive direction and we'll pull up the, the tables here and we'll pull up the, the graphs for it. Um, you know, there's again, you know, three weeks is not a long trial and five days follow up. So, you know, um, so if these cells have been cleared, you know, first of all, we don't know how many of what percentage of senescent cells have been cleared. Um, so that's kind of one issue. They, they do mention in the paper that, you know, they look for a senescence associated secretary, you know, factor. So things that are released by senescent cells in the bloodstream, but they weren't able to find anything conclusive. So no real difference. And they attribute that to basically, um, you know, perhaps the low overall basal amount of, you know, uh, senescence factors circulating in the blood and for them able to successfully detect them. Now, one way you can really kind of do a uh, biochemical or molecular characterization of whether senescent cells have been cleared is to do a bronchioscopy, basically going into somebody's lungs for this condition right here, taking a tissue sample and staining cells and seeing if there's less senescent cells. Um, that's a very, um, you know, uh, you know, it's not a pleasant procedure, um, it, so it's not something that you want to just kind of frequently do. So they, they avoided that for these patients that are kind of already sick. Um, so it's, you know, so we do have kind of a lack of that biochemical data um, to kind of present uh, as far as uh, a depletion of senescent cells. So, so, so that's kind of another issue of this, of this trial here is, is, you know, we don't really know what percentage of, of senescent cells, uh, you know, may have been dropped uh, as a result of this treatment. And that being said, um, the follow-ups for the functional assays were only done, I believe, less than a week after the completion of the, of the three weeks. So, you know, obviously when, when you clear senescent cells for a human, you probably need time for tissues to rebuild and patients to recuperate. So it would be interesting to, to know, if, you know, if there's an in improvement in patients that's long term or if there's a better improvement you know if we did a little more long term follow up but uh, again um you know the praise i have for this paper is they they did as much as they could in in a very short period of time and then published this data so you know and and so this could be a, uh, a good groundwork for a longer term larger trial which i believe um uh james kirkland is actually in the midst of of doing um so let's go back to sharing the screen. So uh, what did they actually look at? So the functional measures they looked at um, are basically pulmonary functions. So they looked at something called forced expiratory volume. So FEV, so basically, or FEV1. So the maximum amount of air exhaled in one second. And then uh, percentage predicted, I believe, is converted to a percentage of normal. Um, so basically, how much can you breathe out, right, in, within a given amount of time? Then related to that is FBC, which is uh, forced vital capacity, which is the total amount of air exhaled during the FBV test. So basically, you know, it's a, this is all a measure of how healthy your lungs are, um, which makes sense because, you know, these pulmonary um, fibrosis is, is something that's affecting your lungs. And then, of course, you know, having adequate intake of oxygen and being able to breathe is correlated with your physical functionality. So they have a six-minute walk distance, meters, a four-minute gait speed, so how fast do you walk, time to chair stand, and this SPPP score, I believe, is an aggregate of a bunch of things. Um, um, probably all of these aggregated together, which uh, stands for short physical performance battery, right? Um, and last, you have this frailty index, which is... Uh, 
abbreviated FI lab score. And that looks like a, a, basically a palette of a number of parameters. So it's sort of like a, um, uh, I guess it's a, a uh, you know, a biological measurement of, of aging, if you will, right? So we talk about biomarkers of aging. So this essentially is um, like that in that, you know, uh, if parameters, you know, that correlate to things that are floating around in your blood, like blood glucose levels and so on and so forth, you know, uh, platelet count. Um, if that's away from the norm, then, you know, then, then you're less healthy and your frailty index basically goes up. So, you know, it's inversely correlated the number to your, your, your frailty as a result. Um, and I believe, you know, that index, that number is, is, has a pretty, pretty strong correlation to, you know, age and, and overall health, right? So you want a frailty index that's low, not high. So it's kind of hard to, you know, to really see what's going on in a chart like this, right? Because there's a lot of noise here, right? So, you know, you have, uh, for example, uh, baseline, um, we look at six minute walk distance, let's just pick a big number here, 447 meters plus or minus 83, right? Because they have 14 people and follow up. So baseline is basically before everything is done, and then follow up is a couple of weeks later, five days after the last dosage of you know uh, of the last uh, round of measurements, right? Um, and then the standard deviation and difference and correlation. So 447 to 468, you know, plus or minus 81, plus or minus 83. Um, these are kind of numbers you would expect when you have very few participants. So I'm going to stop sharing here and kind of what enables you to see this a little better. And this is from their supplemental data is basically these charts here. Um, so this is essentially, so if we go to, you know, figure S2, uh, baseline six minute walk distance. So you have distance in meters you know, on the x-axis, distance in meters on the y-axis, and the y-axis has uh, the follow-up, and then baseline is the baseline, right? So, and, um, and these dots all represent, I believe, participants, so there should be about 14 dots here. And, you know, so obviously if there was no change, everything, all these dots would be on the diagonal here, right? So if you started with a distance of walking of 250 meters, and then you ended with a distance of walking 250 meters, your dot would be right here, and so on and so forth. So anything higher means your, your distance is improved. So you can see a lot of these dots just kind of looking at this, you know. Um, so I guess the information, it's easier for the human eye and for our brains to kind of see differences by looking at patterns. So you can see a lot of this is shifted up, which is good. I don't know why the follow-up chair stands dropped. Um, but aggregating all of this, and there's less dots here probably because, you know, you needed participants to perform all of these tests. So, you know, um, probably for a variety of reasons peculiar to, you know, participant availability, not everybody was able to complete all of these things. So the ones that have, you know, the SVP scores, you know, it looks like they've shifted up, which is promising, you know, for, for uh, this type of study the frailty index, you know, has also mostly gone down. I mean, there's a couple of flyers here that shot up. And again, it's hard to say, um, I'm gonna stop sharing that, hard to say what, what that means because you have 14 participants, their, uh, you know, their severity of, of their idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis was, you know, listed as being mostly either moderate or kind of mild, moderate or severe. So, um, you'd really have to do a much deeper dive into, into the participants and find out, well, you know, did, did it really help people more that had moderate versus severe, uh, you know, um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a lot more um, teasing apart of the data that you can do, uh, which is hard because you have 14 participants. But I think, you know, my gist is just looking at this data, um, you had a good retention rate. They had two different uh, medical centers at which they got participants. So they successfully recruited people. They had them pretty much stick to the protocol. Um, they had a realistic protocol. So, you know, basically concentrations of DQ that you would expect to give when you actually want to do a, a senolytic therapy. Um, the safety profile was pretty good. Um, and, you know, 
based on the very small amount of people that were there, the needle seemed to have nudged towards some improvement, right? And again, this is very short duration. So, you know, the issue is what can we take from this chronically? Because obviously, if we're talking about aging, you want to see a long-term improvement, right? There's, there's a lot of things you can, I'm going to be kind of flippant here, right? You can probably improve somebody's, um, uh, you know, the distance that they, that they traverse within a given unit of time by giving them amphetamines, right? Um, and uh, okay, you know, but that doesn't really cure your, uh, your, 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 your pulmonary fibrosis. That just means in a very short term duration, you've been given a stimulant and you're able to basically make it past the finish line faster and then collapse. And then a one year follow up shows that you're doing much worse, right? So, so, you know, you should keep that in mind um, that if you do see an improvement with, with, some, with some treatment in a short term, um, is, is this really a long lasting effect or is this, you know, something that's kind of a temporary effect that might have a detrimental effect uh, longer term. Um, so this study wasn't, you know, designed to kind of tease that out. We need a longer term study as a result. Um, but based on what we know about these two semolytics, based on the, you know, the, hypotheses, the hypotheses we have, how they function, the prediction would be that, that these are long lasting effects. Um, and for that to, you know, to be made more conclusive, we actually need longer term follow-up, longer term, you know, with more people. And uh, this study laid, uh, I think, an excellent groundwork for that. And really that was the point of the study. Um, so if I were to kind of chime in, um, at the end here, um, because this is not a very long paper, you know, if I were to make some comments, uh, you know, um, they chose for a variety of reasons, um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, you know, because it's affected by senescent cells, um, and senescent cells obviously are, <clears throat> you know, uh, are seen to play a, a pretty strong role, um, at least in a lot of data that we have accumulating from research in um, underlying, um, you know, underlying mechanisms of aging. Having, you know, a treatment that targets this, we can, we can then have a spillover effect to other, um, uh, other uh, diseases of aging. Um, now, if, if the hypothesis is correct that, you know, that uh, senescent cells do underlie many pathologies of aging, then we should see this protocol applicable to um, other disease models that are as a consequence of cellular senescence. So we've covered papers here on our journal clubs that you know, implicate dementias um, and a host of other things that uh, are affected by senescent cells. So um, I think there's a huge area here for, you know, for future clinical trials and maybe present ones being started now uh, to look at all of these other um, indications, right? Uh, so I think we're going to, you know, and this paper opens the floodgates for that. So that's, I think, you know, that's, that's kind of the strong suit from this paper. Um, the other thing that I'd like to, you know, um, kind of point out there is that, uh, you know, the, the dosages that were given here, even though they're realistic, um, one thing to keep in mind is the bioavailability of some of these compounds, particularly flavonoids. Um, so a lot of supplements people take in a lot of trials, uh, when you even go on some of these, you know, um, online trial databases, uh, you know, you get a pill from a manufacturer and of course they do quality assurance. So obviously you're getting the amount of drug that you expect or flavonoid. Um, but just because you pop that pill and it's got one gram or 500 milligrams of something doesn't mean all of it's going to end up in your bloodstream. And, um, that's not kind of a trivial gripe. It's known that the bioavailability of a lot of these substances is really, really, really poor, right? So if you take a gram of, of, of physetin, you know, we're talking way less than 1% might actually get into your bloodstream. Um, you know, it's got a, it's usually absorbed from the lower intestine. So, you know, it's, it, it's got to basically be in a solubilized form that can, that can pass through, um, you know, the cell membrane and, and then end up in your bloodstream. And um, the pill form, you know, even though that's the most popular form for many supplements, 
ironically, is probably the worst form <laughs> of a lot of these things to be ingested in. And probably the best way to do it is to is to have it solubilized with some sort of carrier, some sort of you know lipophilic carrier. And there's a lot of papers out there, and perhaps we'll do a review of one in the near future um, that you know uh, talk about how to best uh, disperse some of these compounds so you get the most of the compound um, entering into your bloodstream, and, and that's basically kind of you know, how it ends up in your bloodstream and how it ends up in the target organs, because obviously if you want to, you know, then have a compound that uh, targets senescent cells um, uh, in the brain, then it's got to also cross the blood-brain barrier, right? So there's, there's all of these issues. So that's, that's the realm of pharmacokinetics. And, um, you know, that, that's one thing that wasn't done in this paper, right? So the participants took 1.25 grams of quercetin, but, you know, um, how much of it actually ended up in the bloodstream of patients. Um, the fact that there appeared to be uh, some improvement uh, is, is, is positive. So, you know, it, you know, so maybe a little bit of some of these compounds goes a long way, but I, I think, you know, for me, having read a bunch of these papers, the bioavailability is, is something crucial and something to uh, maybe focus on in another clinical trial is to really kind of nail down the pharmacokinetics of some of these really good candidate molecules like physetin and quercetin, and um, and there's a number of there's a number of compounds out there that are carriers, you know, um, things that you know package things into nanoparticles and all sorts of other configurations that makes it much easier to you know go from the lower intestine into your bloodstream um, and, and make it you know uh, perhaps flat past and later blood brain barrier. So, um, so I think that would be, you know, a, a great follow-up clinical trial is to nail down those pharmacokinetics. Um, because again, um, you also have to realize that the people taking these compounds are going to be probably older, um, aged, and they might have all sorts of other, you know, um, physical problems. And that in of itself will affect absorbability of these compounds through the intestine and, and how much of it actually gets into the bloodstream. Um, so, you know, that's something that's sort of, you know, some pap papers really, at least papers that focus on this type of, you know, on, on, on bioavailability, they stress this. But, you know, when you look at a lot of trials, that's something that I, I start to now kind of immediately uh, wonder is, you know, um, why a lot of these trials don't look at bioavailability, right? So yeah, you, you give somebody 20 milligrams of something, it doesn't mean they're actually getting 20 milligrams. I mean, 20 milligrams of purified compound doesn't necessarily translate to 20 milligrams of that purified compound in your bloodstream. Um, and that's, and that's, a pretty, um, that's a pretty important point. Um, so bottom line is, I think it's a great uh, jumping off point with this paper think it's, you know, they've checked off all the right boxes. Uh, they set up a protocol in place to at least focus on uh, DQ, which is a good combination. Um, they have their disease model, um, and I think they're, they're forging ahead with more expanded trials as a result. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions. This is the bit where I forget on the on my many screens which one I'm on and where the mute unmute button is. I always do that. I always forget where it is. Let's have a look. We've had quite a lot of activity. Keith was curious about how many uh, onions he would need to eat in order to get an equivalent dosage of what was it, uh, fifteen hundred milligrams? Uh, well, I don't know what the quercetin amount is, but in I've eaten. Um... Which is which is found in onions. Um, I've got a I got a paper somewhere here. Well, I don't know, just not to be flippant, but uh, more more than I can tolerate if I'm going to be expected to be anywhere near Keith in future conferences. Um, quite a lot of quite a lot of onions. Um, well, it's less than a um, hundred. It's you know even in a good onion, and we're talking like red onions. Yeah. A quick search tells me it's less I'll, than 100 milligrams an onion. I'll, I'll, uh, 
Yeah, I'll pull it up and let me see. I got a pile of these papers I was reading here, and and they and basically, uh, people have been looking at effects of freeze dried strawberry supplementation. So strawberries have a lot. Um, you know, blah, 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 blah. I worked I work the strawberries out for fire seating because I did an article not long ago on leaf, and um, it was a lot. Yeah, I mean, and it is a similar thing with all these, all of these related uh, polyphenols and fl uh, flavonoids yeah the, the amount present in dietary uh, sources is very low for example strawberries uh, typically have 160 um ug per g and that is um that's very high um and then the next highest is an apple which is 26.9 that's phycetin which is a, a, a very similar uh, compound and also a senolytic onions they're about 100 milligrams if you're lucky per onion so what yeah, are we and, talking and about have, and you, and, yeah and you got to realize that also the paper I, I looked at where they talked about mm. how many mil, you know uh, how many micrograms of physetin was in x amount of grams of onions or strawberries that's freeze-dried that's devoid of water Right. So we're not talking. So we're <laughs> taking the water out there. So if you if you're if you're using non freeze dried foods, then um, we're talking about bushels. We're not talking about uh, a hand. Oh, there's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, at least 15 onions a day. Uh, Victor, I think, was going to say something as well. Um, need to unmute yourself. There you go, Victor. You're unmuted. How do we improve the bioavailability for, I mean, I guess the supplement market now for quercetin and fistin would be quite big when it shows analytic effects, but yeah. um, how would we know that we receive the amounts we need in the bloodstream? You, well, you, you don't, you'd have to take a look at, and again, it depends on the, on the, you know, it depends on how you take it, right? Because it's like, if you, if you, uh, there's been some trials where, you know, it's been seen that some of these compounds, if you take them with food or you take them mixed with food or mix them with some sort of, you know, um, fats or lipids, um, the bioavailability is way higher than if you just take a tablet and pop it, you know, on an empty stomach. Um, because, you know, it's got to dissolve in, in the, you know, so one thing that I read in these reviews is that if, if it doesn't get through the lower intestine and it makes it to the large intestine, mm -hmm. it's basically these polyphenols are actually just going to be food for the microbes that live in your gut. And it's, yeah. it's not going to really work. So, um, so this is just an aside. So that got me thinking, you know, you probably don't want to take these compounds mixed with probiotics either, right? Because your, your probiotics are supposedly healthy, but they're going to eat your polyphenols that you're, that you're eating. Um, so, you know, I would think that, um, you know, yes, you can probably overcome these problems by just taking, let's say multiple grams, you know, just brute force, a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of pills or, or mixed into some sort of, you know, smoothie and just drink it. Right. Um, but if you want to kind of save on money and save on amounts then and, and increase the, the amount that is in your bloodstream, then we should do a little bit more thinking and, and digging into what's the best carrier for, you know, for these, for these compounds. And a lot of these um, kind of, there's, there's already lots of carriers that are out there um, that are being, um, you know, studied. Um, you know, I remember in the paper that we did again with Kirkland as the last author, there was the Fizetin paper that we did with the mouse models. Um, they gave, they gave Fizetin basically stick a tube down the mouse mouth mouse's throat and basically squirt in physetin, but it's not just, it's not powdered physetin, it's physetin mixed with carriers. And I think in that paper, if, if um, it's in our lab, you know, early journal club, uh, there's, it's a mix, it's an emulsion of things like Fozol 50 and PEG, you know, polyethylene glycol and some other things, which are basically, um, you know, kind of, uh, they disperse the molecule and make it more lipophilic. And um, these things are used in foods and drugs uh, frequently for that reason. Um, from Steve Dabru and DMSO. Yeah, they use DMSO too. DM so Fizetin has a high solubility in DMSO. Um, so, but there's, but for like food grade stuff and for, for drugs, at least tablet form, they, they mix it with a lot of these other compounds that form an emulsion that basically increases the surface area of of the you know the thing you're taking and also makes it you know um more easier to uh 
glom onto the cell membrane and be taken up. And also, of course, the question is when you take the satinib and the quercetin together, I mean, that's another effect on just taking them separately. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's issues of that. Um, you know, so, so, so what I'd like to, you know, what I'd like to see is, is for any future clinical trials is to, um, to do pharmacokinetics, right? Because it's like, you know, it would be interesting to see, you know, because if, if you have patients and so the one thing about senolytics is, is you want to make sure the dose is high enough for them to work, right? You don't want to just say, okay, we, we, it's not working because um, from Steve to everyone, yes, uh, IV could also work or enema probably, well, I'm, maybe. Bypass um, parts of the gut. Um, I mean, it's, it, it is a thought. It's not the most savory thought, but yeah. you could possibly deliver it via enema or, um, or you know, just straight to the brain if that's where you were going with um, yeah. uh, most, you know, yeah. injection. But, but if, 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 and I think the, the data here bears our, us out because, you know, if, 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 uh, if a carrier is found, which I think I'd be surprised if one isn't already available because, you know, people have been mixing carriers with compounds for a long time, especially plant polyphenols. Um, and, and we are already seeing effects with, with, you know, with these tablets, meaning that, you know, um, even with these low doses that are probably bioavailable, you're still seeing an effect. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that if we can boost the blood levels, we probably see, a, uh, you know, we could probably see even a more significant um, kind of a functional effect. Um, you know, so that, so the, really to keep in mind is you, you don't want to, when, when, I, when I put up those tables and we saw, you know, what worked and what didn't, I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, that sort of uh, that sort of interests me because um, you know people are different and like look at you know look at the frailty index. Some some people got worse, right? And most kind of got better. And why are these outliers, right? Is is it have anything? I would. I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say this probably has nothing to do with the satinib and quercetin probably has everything to do with the underlying severity of, of what they already had. Um, you know, because there was no, con there was really no control. Um, also is the bio, you know, depending on the severity of your illness is the bioavailability even there. Right. So if, if you have a, if you have a problem that is making your gut less likely to absorb, you know, these compounds, uh, then you could be misled into thinking that it's not working when you're really just not even delivering the suitable dosage. So I, I think for, you know, a lot of reasons, um, I don't know how expensive it is to check bioavailability profiles. You know, I know there's many different parameters you can look at for pharmacokinetics, but maybe just uh, uh, from Steve to everyone, um, John D. Ferber, are there research sources of desatinib that would not involve getting a doctor to write an RX. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. It dip, so desatinib is a prescribed compound. Um, and if you want to take it for personal use, probably not for research purposes. Yeah, there's probably ways. It depends on if it's uh, how long it's been out there, right? If it's been longer than 20 years, which it might've been, then you can buy these compounds. Um, they won't ship it to your house, though. They won't ship it to a research institute or or, or a commercial address, right? And um, you know, um, that's how that goes. Um, I think I've ranted about other things like metformin. You could most likely get metformin for research purposes. Metformin is a prescription drug still, but um, for some bizarre reason, even though its safety profile is excellent and better than aspirin and certainly Tylenol, um, you cannot get it without a doctor's order. Hmm. Um, yeah, Keith says, I believe it decreases wound healing. And I think he's referring to senolytics, which is one reason you want to do intermittent births rather than a sustained therapy. Um, uh, yeah, maybe, um, but also hypothetically, you wouldn't need to do it all the time if you figured out the senescent cells. Um, were there any cautions about taking senolytics too often? I think uh, Keith you know, mentioned that I have to double check the wound healing, you know, 
aspect, but if you're, you know, um, the negative will affect immune function or other things. I mean, the dosage is critical for everything, but it depends on the, what senolytic you're talking about. At least the ones that we've looked at here, like Fizetin, um, I don't see any negative effects. Um, if anything, you would have positive effects on your immune function, right? If you're clearing out senescent cells. Um, so taking them too often, I mean, or too much, I mean, anything, even water will kill you if you drink too much of it, right? So it, it depends on, on what you mean by, by um, realistically too much or, or too often. Um, those, are, those are numbers that, you know, we don't really know, right? We do know that you can take grams of the stuff and um, it's not going to kill you. Um, at least for some of them, I'm not saying all of them, I'm saying for like things like bisetin. Um, but uh, how frequently can you take them, you know? I mean, nobody's done these long-term studies. Nobody's nobody's taken Fizetin for every day for 20 years because, you know, people have only, the whole concept of senolytics is pretty new. Right? But so also, of course, what we really need, I would say, is a lot of anecdotal evidence. In a sense, people are self-experimenting with it now. So we have a lot of things that people report that we can start to draw some kind of data mm -hmm. from. That should be possible. Right. So uh, and, um, it is true that senescent cells are involved in wound healing. Um, so if I remember correctly, it's the fibroblasts that actually become senescent and it like turns them off and it prevents excessive production of collagen and hence scarring to yeah. occur. So um, yeah, for that reason, you will not want to take uh, analytics all the time constantly. And of course, in your skin, that might not be an issue, but I guess the same process might also happen in the organs. And if that will be the case, then of course, that will be much more. Also in young people, of course. So that's why you should probably wait with trying it out until you really have accumulated them and not take it while you're already young and healthy. Yes. Right. So, um, so, so at, least, at least the predicted functionality of how synolytics work, it's not something you can take as a prophylactic, right? For, you know, so... Um, so somebody said, uh, is there known research about simultaneous administration of senolytics, i.e. Uh, uh, with something else such as metformin? In other words, uh, what are the effects of co-administration with compounds? Excellent question. We actually looked at a paper that addressed um, synergistic effects, potentially, of compounds that affect multiple pathways. And uh, this was done, I believe, in C. elegans. It was like really, really kind of yeah, round. Jan Gruber, uh, as mm -hmm. I recall. It was kind of, it was very pioneering. I like, I like the paper because they used like, um, you know, they used, uh, uh, you know, they had some algorithms, some, you know, some, uh, some software algorithms that they basically designed to basically help tease through tons of data and see overlapping pathways and what compounds might actually, you know, if you could potentially get a synergistic effect from, from kind of targeting multiple um, pathways and, uh, at least from the, the data from that paper, which was, you know, very basic research in a very good way, suggested, yeah, that's, that's a very viable um, approach to take. So, um, so basically, you know, hitting multiple pathways will give you added benefits. Um, so I would, you know, based on that one paper, I would, I would say that, that, uh, the field looks promising for additional work in combining um, therapies. And I think metformin is a good one because uh, again, it's got an excellent safety profile, um, you know, to use in combination with, uh, you know, with periodic dosing of synolytics or, um, you know, uh, something else. Um, but even, uh, even multiple uh, combinations of senolytics are, are of interest as well. Just to mention uh, uh, Peter de Kaiser. I'm not on commission uh, for Peter, by the way, but I do talk about him quite a bit. Um, the Dutch researcher Peter de Kaiser, who works in the field of senolytics, um, recently uh, in an interview with us, mentioned that because different senescent cells, they're finding that the, they're not, there's not just one type of senescent cell. L there are lots of sort of variety in them and they all use different um, pro-survival pathways. So some might use BCL, for example, uh, BCL2 and, and so on in, 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 in order to evade destruction. Uh, 
And he was saying uh, last year, late last year, it's very likely that we're going to need a combination of different cell analytics. So you might see fisetin, you might see quercetin, you might see the start nib, and you, you may even see them all used at the same time. It's something that we're testing out in uh, mice. Uh, we are looking at two and even three compound uh, combinations, and that's part of MMTP, uh, Major Mouse Testing Program. Hopefully we'll, um, we'll have some data soon, I would think, this year. Uh, fingers crossed. So yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Chris McCauley said, "How reliable are COAs?" So I believe that's what a clinical outcome assessments. Um, I think uh, for Fizetin, there seem to be suppliers with substantially different prices, each with a uh, clinical outcome assessment. Um, I guess that comes down to quality assurance for all these companies, right? They all have, you know, you, you, you know, I don't know, uh, right? So. <laughs> You, you, you get what you pay for. Um, so clearly, clearly, if you're going to go to a supplier, sorry, clearly, if you're going to go to a supplier, you 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 want to make sure that they're at least you know doing quality assurance, you know, from at least maybe a third party where they send out and do batches and, and do QA, right? That's why things are so expensive. Partly from when you get it from a supplier like Sigma Aldrich, yeah. right? That's ten times more. Yeah, you can you can get the same salt from another supplier for ten times less. But if you're doing research that you want to really make sure that what you're getting is sodium chloride with no minimal contaminants, and you want to assay to a you know a certain degree, that's really what you're kind of paying for mm -hmm. is is that purity check and that that uh, assessment. So, you know, I think that that's an issue. I mean, these are all things that are really fundamental and in some case trivial. But you know, when but you have to. When, when we we really want when you really want this to work and we all do you want to make sure that your source supply is what it is so you know you probably if you're going to invest that much time to do a clinical trial at the very least get your samples and send them to a third party for analysis to make sure that it's you know what it, what it is um, and then and then I would also follow up with with do bioavailability to make sure that the configuration that you're giving it to um, for each patient um, is uh, bioavailable, bioavailable, right? So maybe it's not working for some, for patient, you know, one versus patient two, just because when you do then look at their blood profile, you realize, oh, it's, Fizetin isn't getting into this person's bloodstream, right? So that's, and then, and then you can correct, you know, then you can normalize the data on, on that for that and then realize, wow, it's, it's works fantastic if you get enough of it into somebody's bloodstream, right? So, so doing all of these kind of checks and balances when you have, um, when you set up a trial, um, I think is, is, is going to be crucial, um, to, uh, you know, make, make sure that it's actually working, but also not to discard anything, you know, prematurely and say, well, it's, you know, we're, where it's not working um, because Fizetin just doesn't work, right? Um, so you don't want to discard it for, for those trivial reasons. Um, so all of these checks and balances basically comes down to minimizing those error bars that you see, right? Because if you just look at, if you just have a group of patients and you and you kind of give them Fizetin and have them all do, um, you know, a test, you know, either for cognitive, you know, functionality or something else, um, error bars are going to be all over the place, right? And the more the the, the more uh, fine tuning you could do with these parameters to see if you get similar bioavailability to everybody, and um, obviously similar compliance, and uh, and that the that the purity is the same, um, then hopefully you can get those error bars to shrink and shrink. Um, and, Get some something meaningful out of it. Um, but that being said, you know this was a I think this was a great foundational pilot study. That was the that was the point of this, um, and I think it you know it sets up a good template for senolytic trials in general, not just desatinib and quercetin, but fizetin and anything else that comes along. Um, and even though they looked at uh, you know idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, you know, I think what they did here, I think it sets the groundwork to, you know, you could just replace that with your other disease model of choice, right? Alzheimer's and, uh, and swap it out and, 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 and 
kind of go through a similar, um, you know, basically this would be a good template is what I'm saying for, for other studies to follow. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the teams on this paper really did a great job, um, you know, getting this information out there to the public, to other researchers um, to use as a template to, you know, to launch their, their, their own trials. And um, I think that's, that's where the major worth uh, uh, for me for, for this paper uh, is. Yeah, so it's not necessarily the size of the effect, which let's be fair, it, um, it has been very hyped in um, certain media outlets. Uh, I, I did uh, sort of roll my eyes a little bit when I saw um, some outlets claiming there were dramatic effects. There weren't really dramatic effects. There was certainly some improvement though, wasn't there, Oliver? I mean, you know, and, um, you know, like getting up out of a chair a little bit faster uh, and things like this. And yeah. these are really actually quite good uh, aging biomarkers, what we call uh, functional aging biomarkers. And, you know, the um, age meter that we uh, we helped uh, fundraise for uh, a while ago, as you recall, it does look at these basic mm -hmm. sort of functional uh, tests. And they're great as well to include because, A, they're relatively cheap, if not free to do, and they're also relevant to everyone because at the end of the day it is about quality of life. So that's why I think these particular biomarkers, functional yeah. uh, biomarkers are great. So like the six meter walk, walk test is great as well. You know, we, we don't necessarily um, need to know everything, but things like this are really basic, you know, is, is Bob going to be able to get, get to the shops with the, uh, and back easier after a course of treatment and that's really at the end of the day it's quality of life is, and that's what we're in for isn't it yeah and like i said it'd be good to see um you know long-term follow-up um at least if not these particular patients although they certainly you know are, they certainly have have them have their records and it's hard obviously humans are humans right you people get you know you lose track of people people die for reasons unconnected to their illness. So, you know, that's why you also want a large sample population because if, if you want to then see what the long-term effects are from these treatments, you need to find these same people a year later, two years later, and, and run assessments, right? Uh, although that's, you know, that there's a lot of other problems with that as well, right? Because people could have done other interventions in the meantime and so on and so forth. So, um, but again, bottom line, uh, I think it was a great pilot. I think they, you know, they did a good job, uh, excellent job laying out a, a roadmap um, for for other other trials. Um, and you know, the the, com the the comments that I have, the you know, the gripes when it comes to bioavailability, um, it's not so much folk, you know directed at this paper, but in general. And you know, if if but having this roadmap in place other researchers could then address those concerns, right? You can use this as a template. You could swap out your disease model of interest, swap out your senolytic of interest, um, you know, recruit the patients and then pile on a bioavailability, you know, assay or form of kinetic assay on top of what you're doing, right? And, and, and kind of address those concerns. Um, so yeah, you know, it's not a paper we typically do, but I think it's something that uh, we'll be probably doing more and more of as, you know, as this field is, you know, um, getting to a point where uh, we now have interventions that look really promising and are um, accessible and low risk and, you know, fairly inexpensive. Um, and um, I'm hoping to see a lot more of these types of trials. And again, you know, it's really the bottom line isn't at this point for these types of trials, it's not technology. It's really, it's really money and inertia and getting people together. I mean, you know, you got to organize, you got, you need somebody or, or, or a group of people who can organize people. And then, and then you need, uh, you need people to either have the resources that they can independently do this, or you need, uh, find funding to do this. Right. And, um, uh, let's, let's face it, 
there's a million distractions out on this planet and it's not easy um, to do that, uh, to convince people. So, um, yeah. Well, you know, it always comes down to the funding as so many researchers keep telling me, they say, oh, it's no problem as working aging, we can work it out, you know? It's, it's always, it always comes back to the lack of funding, but you know, the actual technical challenges, not so much. It's, it's, it's really about keeping the lights on in the lab and uh, keeping people uh, working away at the problem. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing I like about this round of, you know, analytics that are being studied, maybe not, well, perhaps to Satnip because it's, you know, I, I think it's, if it's not um, off patent, it probably will soon be. But certainly other things like Fizetin, um, these are pretty cheap. They're pretty available. Even if you make an optimal carrier and you patent it, whatever. I mean, this stuff is pretty readily available out in markets, right? So really the, the, what we're lacking here is clinical data, right? So, um, you know, I think, I think this should be aggressively funded by philanthropists, this type of research, because... Um, if it works and all the suggestions and, and the effects are long lasting and all the suggestions thus far in animal models and this initial pilot study suggests the answer is yes, then all of the gripes people have about, you know, anti-aging research being limited to a, you know, the, the ultra rich few people, right, is goes out the window, right? Because uh, these compounds are, they're not expensive. But um, something I want to point out, if you look at all the companies right now who are developing uh, senolytics, I mean, the, the, they will not profit unless they are, their senolytic compounds are superior to things like the satinib and Foxo 4 dr mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that comes down to issues of, of, of the companies themselves. But I'm just saying that you or me or, or anybody else who wants to do this, um, the only thing preventing me from well there's a couple of things preventing me from ultra dosing myself with Fizetin is is um what's the optimal dose right um finding a source of it that's reliable basically if all of these things if all of these things can be kind of nailed down in a series of clinical trials um but you're not 90 years old so you're not willing to take no, I'm will. I'm I'm willing to take it, guys. I'm I'm convinced that Fizetin is 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 completely safe. Um, I'm basically I don't have any. That's that's just me speaking. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I was kind of on the fence with Senolytics because some of the stuff that was being you know used, you know, was not directly translatable. These this was still at the time very um, research oriented. I mean, we we needed people needed to do the proof of principle to show that yeah, getting rid of senescent cells using transgenic mice is, is you know, the, that hypothesis is correct. And, and doing some of the things that needed to be done was not translatable to humans, right? So now seeing that there's compounds that are, you know, have an excellent safety profile and that uh, have all these additional knock-on health benefits um, actually are functioning as senolytics, I mean, um, I'm actually quite shocked that, that it could be that easy. Um, and you know, um, it's almost too good to be true. Let's put it this way. Um, uh, that all we need to do is get the right dose and the right bioavailability for something that is readily available and it's going to work fantastically. Um, how come Bill Gates isn't giving us a hundred million dollars? We doesn't, we don't even need a hundred million dollars. We need, you know, we need, we need way less than that to, to start these trials. And on that note, if anybody has actually got his uh, personal number, we can hook us up, get in touch. We wouldn't mind uh, speaking to the Gates Foundation, but uh, to start, Nib, just to, just to circle back, is actually a, gene a generic now. Um, it, it is quite an old drug, and it's been around. It, 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 it sometimes found under the name Spry Cell, which is uh, the trademark name, but it's uh, it is a generic now. So, and I think Navataclax, which is what Unity are uh, are using, I believe that 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 doesn't have too long either on it before it goes generic. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's interesting. So the costs, as you say, not necessarily not necessarily that much. 
Yeah, and these are synolytics, the, you know, like the model for the, how they function. We're not talking about uh, taking these pills for the rest of your life, which is, like I said, <laughs> uh, you know, we have a therapeutic intervention here that's almost too good to be true. And um, why philanthropists and governments aren't piling onto this, I don't know. You know, it's, uh, it strikes me as weird. It's like, Either, either they work or they don't. And there's, you know, there's, there's very little risk involved. I don't know. I, I, I have the feeling it might be a habeas corpus um, uh, issue. So they're waiting for the body to see the body. You know, they want, they want that proof. And I think, you know, there, there may be a tipping point. It is sort of reaching that tipping point. I've noticed uh, there's a stark contrast in, in the field from like even four years ago. Um, compared to sort of the last year, year and a half, enthusiasm for senolytics and even doing some about aging is definitely ramped up. There is a lot more money coming into the field. You know, people like Jim Mellon and other, other forward thinking investors who understand that it's a bit of a longer game than traditional pharmaceuticals. Um, they're getting involved. And it, I think the tide is really starting to turn. But I think, you know, there's definitely going to need to be that uh, habeas corpus moment where, you know, where there's real solid sort of clinical evidence before you'll convince some people. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it, it's a shame. I mean, we, we read all these papers, you know, we know, we know what the deal is and we try to kind of get this information out there to everybody. And, um, uh, but you know, the fact of the matter is um, for most people, people, what's obvious to us, and when I say most people, I'm including um, very knowledgeable, rich people, investors, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. is, is not obvious to them, right? And it's, it just comes down to that. And, uh, you know, we're all humans with our quirks and idiosyncrasies where we could be genius in one respect and a complete dunderhead when it comes to other things, right? We all have our blinders. And it, it just comes down to that. And, and you know, and, you know, in, in, in that sense, it's a shame. But, um, you know, so there is no conspiracy to keep analytics down, I think. It's just a matter of critical mass and getting, getting the right people to listen. And, and, you know, and that being said, just taking this, this more strategic viewpoint of the entire field of, of aging research and longevity, I mean, it's only now recently in, in our lifetimes that it's kind of emerged from the doldrums of, of where it has been research wise and that we now have um, this massive research that is connecting the dots and that there is this, uh, this, this model of aging and uh, longevity uh, that is reaching scientific consensus that wasn't nearly there even when I started grad school, um, you know, in, in early 2000 so it's so it's it's in the grand scheme of things it's 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 we're we've kind of hit this kind of exponential point right so for a long time that tale has been you know a whole bunch of nonsense about fountains of youth and you know and snake oil and, and things that don't work and Ponce and, de Leon as well if I yeah. hear about Ponce de Leon one more time in an article I swear I'm gonna go crazy and, and, a lot of, and a lot of time, and, and really, and, and most research and most people have, you know, not everything has been a fraud. A lot of people have meant well, but people have been tackling symptoms of aging and because there's not really been a, a, a good model for what's going on. And it's only in, in, you know, past several years that we've actually seen, or past maybe 10 years, that we've seen a, a model crystallize um, that, you know, we're still not quite there yet. But, um, but it's, it's um, the consensus is reaching based on all the data that we've, we've accumulated. And, um, and that's what we do here at Lead from Lifespan.io is to try to get that information, the realization of that, that we're, it, it, basically we are at that tipping point um, for investors and other people who are concerned about health and longevity to, to pay attention. Um, and that, you know, that this is real and, um, and, you know, if you, if you mention this to just some, you know, I think we all should kind of, if you know where this field is and where it's been and where it's headed, um, don't keep this information to yourself. Let people know. 
you know, let your colleagues know just as an aside. Oh, by the way, you know, I, I think we're going to beat aging and this is why. And, 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 you know, as a matter of fact, because now, now these are the tools and technologies that we have. Um, I think you'll be surprised how shocked and surprised your colleagues will be to hear that um, because you, you may be taking this for granted, um, but don't take it for granted. You should, you should kind of let people know that, that, uh, that the technology is real uh, and, and the science is real and um, we are at this tipping point. Yeah, it's, it's definitely getting better. Um, you know, recent surveys, um, they did a recent survey about uh, life extension and even indefinite uh, lifespans. I don't know if you heard about that, Oliver. No. Um, they did a, do you know like the Harrison and the Pew studies about um, about six six years ago or so, they asked the same question. Hmm. Um, well, they recently, well, in fact, last month they did a new survey and it was interesting and it was, nice. It was significant, the amount of people. Uh, I'm just trying to find the figures for you. I'll send, I'll send you the actual uh, data if you'd like. Uh, ah, there we go. It's uh, out of a thousand participants, which is, you know, a fair amount. They, uh, 797 out of a thousand wanted to live to 120 or longer. Over half of these 797 people uh, desired unlimited lifespan. So around about 40% of the Americans surveyed last month said not just 120, but they prefer unlimited lifespans, which is an increase of previous years. So there's, th things are definitely turning. The tide is definitely turning. And I'd like to say that it's mostly due to the outreach efforts of LEAF and Lifespan.io. <laughs> <laughs> maybe well, you know well, a, a little bit a little bit we do our part that's it oh keith just said yeah one fifth of americans were in favor of straight up living forever uh and one quarter were, uh, of millennials that's interesting so yeah i think people are starting to think about the possibilities now these te technologies are becoming tangible it's not something that you can dismiss as science fiction like maybe 10, 15 years ago, which a lot of people used to do. And it was a, a bit of a career risk, in fact, I understand in academia, if you decide, if you if you stated that you could do something about aging. Unfortunately, the other three quarters were in favor of unlimited warfare and genocide. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, yeah, let's not get on to the, uh, get on to that, that, that topic because, uh, yeah, we're, we're in the business of, uh, making people alive not uh, not dead yeah oh keith said that's even higher than the last uh, baseline it'll be interesting to see the change over time there yeah we could we should have a roundtable discussion in the journal club on 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 ethical considerations because i i texted keith a, a you know a bbc article about um you know euthanasia in in denmark and i actually found this troubling in that um you know the amount of people opting for euthanasia when they get diagnosed with early stages of dementia has gone up. And what I was, what I found disturbing about that article is that couldn't, wouldn't you want to at least try, you know, some of these interventions that we've been talking about if you're at the early stages um, is, is the only advice your medical doctor can give you is suicide. Um, especially when you have not reached full-blown dementia, and evidently that's that's the case in Denmark. And well, I was... I mean, very often it, the problem is the family, if, because if the fa person gets a side effect, the family tries to sue the doctor. That's... Yeah, well, well, the the other issue was that uh, the the way the legal structure, at least according to the article, is that if you get too far gone, then you can't make the decision anymore. So a lot of people are preemptively basically choosing to off themselves uh, with the aid of the medical establishment to basically kind of, so that decision is taken out of their hands. But I mean, based on what we've covered in all this time here, I mean, I mean, I don't know. Wouldn't you want to at least try if I was eaten? I mean, before you, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, really what's, what's the risk, right? At that point. 
or, or some of the other interventions that are being, um, that we've considered here. Um, and and I, I, I don't know, when I read that article, I was a little shocked because I was like, I understand the reasoning, but at the same time, in the past couple of years, we've now seen uh, extraordinary evidence to suggest that dementia is reversible and, and at least, at least maybe in the early stages. So, and, and the article did not even mention that, did not even discuss that as a possibility. So I found that a bit shocking that at least according to the BBC article, or at least according to the medical establishment, at least for a major Western country like Denmark, the concept that dementia is even remotely reversible is a non-starter. Are you reversing now? Are you referring to vascular or uh, Alzheimer? Um, they weren't specific. They, they weren't specific uh, about it in the article. Um, they were basically, you know, it, it was, it was, it, the article was just focused on euthanasia, but the, the emphasis was that, um, of the article was that, you know, uh, for legal reasons, you know, people are, are kind of choosing that preemptively. And, um, um, and from the research that we've covered here, it need not be a death sentence, right? At, at least from, from what we're seeing. Um, so I, I just find it really strange that in that otherwise well-researched article, the impression one got after reading the article is that dementia is irreversible. There's nothing we can do about it. Suicide is the best option. I disagree with all three of those, um, at least, you know, based on what we've seen in the past couple of years. Maybe you've also heard about the Netherlands, uh, you know, they're quite liberal and they have this new completed life uh, law uh, that allows people over 75 to get euthanasia without any questions just because they're over 75 years old. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I, I think that's a slippery slope, really, Oliver, just to interject. I think it's a very slippery slope because you could end up with an older person who's not very well being pressured by family members or they feel that they're a burden and don't really genuinely want to throw the towel in, but feel that they should. And I think that's that is absolutely I'm, wrong. Yeah, I'm you know, I'm I'm under the, uh, you know, this this obviously is a much broader topic, you know, even outside of aging, you know, somebody's, yeah. you know, somebody's mental state. Um, uh, there's been a lot of articles suggesting that things may have in some cases gone too far where, you know, people have, uh, people have basically, however you want to phrase it, assisted suicide, summary execution, whatever, have, have basically stated that, um, uh, my reason for not wanting to live is my general ennui and fed upness with life. And that's a sufficient reason. Um, you know, I have my, you know, my, my philosophy on life is, is to die trying. Right. Um, and you know, if, and I'm not, and I'm not kind of an extremist here, but, um, I don't want to dangle out false hope for people, but really, the research that we have right now suggests it's reversible and that at, if it's, and, and, and we have interventions that maybe will not help everybody, uh, but will potentially, you know, help a, 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 a significant cohort of people that, that, you know, have, um, uh, you know, have a particular dementia because dementia is, I'm just painting as a broad stroke saying dementia is like saying cancer, right? There's dementia is, is a manifestation of, of symptoms that of, of many underlying causes, right? It could be due to neurofibrillary tangles, could be beta amyloid plaques, could be due to concussion, could be due to, I mean, there's, there, and, and so some interventions we have right now might actually cure or reverse, you know, some forms of dementia. Um, you know, and, and a lot of times, even when it comes to clinical practice, um, you know, I mean, you, you can't get it, give somebody a definitive, at least my understanding, a definitive, um, assessment of, of Alzheimer's, unless the person is already dead and you can basically start counting beta amyloid plaques, right? So everything, everything up until somebody's alive 
it's it's really hard to pin down exactly what sort of dementia that you have. Um, but that being said, we have a number of interventions here in the pipeline that have a very high probability of working. And um, I'm just kind of surprised that, um, at least in the article that I read, that that wasn't even mentioned um, as, as, as a possibility. And, you know, which, which isn't a false hope, which is a real hope. Um, and that this wasn't even kind of, um, you know, I, I thought the article did readers a huge disservice by not, by not kind of, um, by not, by not uh, mentioning that to people. Um, so, you know, I know maybe it's something, maybe it's something I should write to, you know, to the author and say, um, you got to let people know that uh, it's, it's uh, not as clear cut as you portrayed it in the article. It's not a death sentence um, necessarily. And, uh, you know, there, there are interventions that uh, may work and, uh, and I'm being realistic here. You know, I'm not saying that uh, they have a, that they, that they completely are, are um, kind of a last resort therapy, but there's good data here backing this up. Yeah, there's a lot of things like cancer and things like that that are really progressing fast as well uh, with, with solutions like CAR-T and even more evolutions uh, of, of immunotherapies. So, you know, never say never. Yeah. And I definitely think that we are on the cusp of big changes in medicine. Uh, and as, as oh, well, I'm sure all of us do, otherwise why would we be here, right? <laughs> you know, and basically it's our job to help try and push that along as much as we can. And uh, yeah, we can only do what we can do really. And we'll give it, a, we'll give it a shot, but yeah, here's hoping. And we'll, uh, and, and, and to circle back to Senalytics, hopefully we'll start seeing more of these trials and uh, you know, Scripps Mayo seem to be very keen on, on pushing things forward. Uh, James Kirtland in particular, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm pretty, pretty hopeful that, you know, whilst not everything's going to necessarily work or work as intended or, or, you know, we are definitely making progress here. So I'm pretty positive about the future. So, yeah. But yeah, we, we, we could, we could definitely, um, we could definitely discuss the ethical side of things at some point. And uh, yeah. That's certainly something for down the line, if, if that's what we want to do. And really, that's our final message, right? Yeah. You've got to stay positive. Otherwise, why yeah. be here? Akuna Matata and all that, you know? That's my philosophy. What is that? <laughs> Akuna Matata. You don't know that? No. Some, Hakuna Matata. Somebody, uh, somebody hasn't been watching The Lion King, folks. Oh dear! There we go. Oliver's got some homework. He's going to have to watch the uh, the Lion King. You mean the actual Broadway play? You can watch that version if you'd like. But I just I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in New York City, so I, I, should, I could. You do could that. do, but it's basically a trouble-free philosophy, and I'm not going to spoil it anymore. But it's basically basically the message is of Hakuna Matata is be happy, go lucky, and be positive, which I think is really something that everybody should try at least and do and i think there's plenty of reason in aging research to to be positive it's not this big unknowable unsolvable daunting thing that some people would have you believe there is real progress oliver thinks there's going to be consensus on aging soon i don't know about that we'll discuss that more in berlin <laughs> i'm not sure we're going to we're going to have consensus within the next few years, but things are well, at least at least at least consensus amongst the researchers that um, matter. Well, I was going to go that far. That that I that uh, I agree with. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch! Good burn, Oliver. Good burn. <laughs> but uh, on that note, yeah, because we could be talking about the deleterium theory, which is. Uh, Vadim Gladyshev's um, com combined theory, which is very good. Uh, you've got sends, you've got hallmarks. They're all sort of moving in that direction. So I don't know. 
I'll have a bet with you, and we'll see if we see who's the closest to consensus. Let's do it like that. We'll discuss that in Berlin at the un uh, Undoing Aging Conference, which I'm just going to put a little plug for. So in Berlin, and that is uh, thanks to SENS and the Health uh, oh, what's it, uh, Forever Healthy Foundation. And that'll be uh, towards the end of March. So do check that out if you get the opportunity. And Oliver, I'm sure you want to probably mention our conference as well, maybe. Oh, yeah. So um, I don't, I don't uh, have a blurb I can put up there, but uh, if you missed us last July, I believe it was July 28th, I think. Um, where's the 18th? That was last July um, here in New York City. Then you got a second chance to, uh, and, and actually four chances because we have a second chance and it's a two-day conference uh, this time around. So you can see us either, either of two days. Um, and it will be at the Rose Auditorium here at the Cooper Union uh, where I work. And uh, you can join us across the street at the oldest operational pub uh, for drinks with, uh, with the speakers, um, the McSorley's Pub House, which has been extant since 1854, uh, which isn't very old um, in European time, but is ancient in the United States. Um, <laughs> we've, I think the pub, I think we've got like two pubs older than that within walking distance here, really. But yeah, yeah. but yes, yeah, so you, you you need to sort of look after your, your history. You don't, you, yeah. I believe, I believe you have a, te a Tesco's from 1854. Tesco's from 1850. I think we, you know, I think Tesco's was like 1970 or something. But we do, we do have incredibly old pubs in the UK. If you ever, if you ever visit, um, ridiculous things like um, the pub called A Trip to Jerusalem, which is built into the castle walls at Nottingham, uh, and that's about. 800 years old and it still sells beer so there you go you can never keep an englishman uh, away from his beer and that's the moral of the story so, so, uh, <laughs> so that's that's a bit of new york city trivia for people right now if you want to visit the oldest working pub in new york city in lower manhattan it is mcsorley's 1854 right across the street from where i work but uh, but in general um, do check out our conference it's on the 11th to 12th of july and visit our website to find out more about that and uh yeah don't get too distracted by the beer it's not necessarily good for you so that's that's it that's about wraps it up on that positive note thanks to everyone who's joined us today and a, a, a shout out to the lifespan heroes and thank you for for uh, being our supporters uh, every month because without you we couldn't do uh, shows and we couldn't talk about beer and things like that without you <laughs> and um, if you'd like to learn how, how to become a, a lifespan hero and support us uh, you can visit lifespan.io forward slash hero and we will see you next time and we'll let you know what the topic is soon so thanks everyone and uh, stay safe all right cheers